cities are places where we live, where we work and where we play. Uh, Western Australia is seeing Perth emerge as a truly city of some standing uh, and as it grows and prospers, um, I think of Perth as Australia's West Coast capital. Um, most of us being uh, based in Western Australia know Asia World and I imagine most of us have travelled to most of the major cities uh, in that region. Uh, Western Australia has an unusual status, primarily because of our strength in natural resources and our particular strong trading relationship with the major countries of Northeast Asia and increasingly Southeast Asia. But if you think of those countries and their cities, uh, Tokyo, Hong Kong, Shanghai, Beijing, uh, Singapore, Jakarta, Mumbai, uh, and others. They are city-states. They have huge populations. They have a huge dynamism. Uh, they are an important force of growth, of social development, of sport, of arts, uh, everything. And indeed, cities in those areas uh, have an energy and a life of their own that can be almost independent of the country in which they're hosted. And I guess Singapore, the city, is the state. Um, and I've been very conscious of that as I've travelled around the region over the, the last 20 years. And uh, when I was fortunate enough to become Premier, I was quite determined um, that we would do something special uh, for the city of Perth. We would raise its facilities, its status, we'd work with the Lord Mayor and the Perth City Council to achieve that. And I think we can all see now, a few years on, the city, the Perth City is going through an absolute uh, physical transformation. Obviously Elizabeth Key sinking the rail line, the new stadium um, and so on. Um, and that's taken a great deal of effort and I want to thank the Lord Mayor and the, and the City of Perth councillors for the way in which they have worked with the state government uh, to see these projects come to fruition. It's been a great partnership and is a one in 100 years transformation of our city. I think the criticism of those projects has all but disappeared and I think uh, particularly to a younger generation, which to me is anyone under 50, um, is enjoying the transformation. Uh, I particularly uh, wanted Robert Doyle to come and talk to us uh, about Melbourne, and I'm sure you'll make some observations about Perth as well. Uh, Melbourne is a very gracious city. Um, without, I guess, the obvious economic advantages that West Australia has in terms of its natural resources, Melbourne has continued to prosper and grow. And uh, as uh, Robert Doyle uh, so rudely interjected, the fourth most, four years in a row is the most livable city in the world. And Melbourne is a gracious city. Um, it's developed its art, it's developing its sporting character, it's maintained its heritage, and it is a, a beautiful, lovely city to be in. Um, so Robert, uh, as you know, has been um, Lord Mayor of Melbourne for seven years. Uh, he was a member of state parliament for 14 years, but went on to bigger and better things. Um, he's got a very successful business career and uh, a very young child. So um, it's all going Melbourne, obviously. Uh, could you uh, please welcome uh, a good friend of ours, uh, Robert Doyle. Did you notice how Colin emphasised how gracious the city was without necessarily extending that accolade to the Lord Mayor of Melbourne? <laughs> I've got the microphone now. Um, could I first acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land and the water that surround us here, the people of Noongar. And I want to pay my deep personal respects to their elders past and present and thank their elders, particularly those of Ingrid, who do such great work throughout our community as we meet here today. Um, at the city of Melbourne, we like to acknowledge our first peoples. We're a very young city. We're younger than you, uh, founded in 1835, and I think you're 1829. But I think we should be very proud, though we're young cities, that our first peoples are the oldest continuous culture in the world and we do like to celebrate that in the city of Melbourne. Um, could I acknowledge someone who is a very good friend of mine, the Honourable Colin Barnett, Premier of Western Australia, and a politician I admire very much, so I was delighted when he uh, offered me the chance to come and speak to you. Um, my friend Lisa Scafidi, the Right Honourable, the Lord Mayor of Perth. Uh, John Langland, uh, the Chairman of the Committee for Perth, Marianne Fulker, the CEO, William Hames, who is joining us later. Members of Parliament uh, who are here, particularly my old colleague, Peter Katzambanis, um, and fellow mayors, I'm, I'm delighted that, that you are here as well, and uh, I'd be very pleased uh, afterwards if you make yourself known to me. It's always good to meet a fellow traveller. You've made me a bit craven. I was going to come in and blow Melbourne's trumpet and do all those sorts of things. This is a very large and, you know, it's a long way to the door through a very big crowd here. So 
I'm, I'm going to shamelessly praise Perth well, you know, during the course of this, but uh, they'll be ad lib. No, they won't be ad lib remarks at all. Let, let me tell you about what I think about in, in Melbourne, and I'm not. I'm certainly not here to give you some lesson in what makes a great city. That that is not my purpose in being here, because I think all of us as city leaders share interests. We share interests in what gives our cities vitality. And Colin talked about some of that in the infrastructure provision, and I saw that remarkable installation of the diver and the young girl that you had here recently. You know, they're the examples of vitality, I think, that I think about in, in our cities. I think what makes a successful city community, because that glue is important. What gives our cities their heart and soul? And more of that a bit later too. How do we attract energy, innovation, creativity into our city? And how do we make it sustainable, environmentally, socially, and economically? And they are all important aspects of sustainability. When I think about the life of my city, I think, why would people choose to live in Melbourne? Why would they choose to live in Melbourne? Why would they enjoy working in our city? Why would they visit our city? Because if we get those whys right, then you actually do develop the vibrancy that you need to get the city that you're after. You might even finish up the world's most livable city for four years in a row. If I'm, have I mentioned that yet, by the way? Um, some of you may have heard of Sydney, a small declining industrial town to our north. Uh, they're number seven. Seven is good for Sydney. It's kind of like a participation certificate when we get the gold medal, but... I, I, I wasn't going to do that. I was going to rise above that, but obviously I, you know, I'm just not capable of that, as, as uh, Colin rightly pointed out. Let me think a bit about that last question. Why would people want to visit our city? And, and this is something that I've been thinking about a lot. If you go back centuries, and I do mean centuries, people travelled and visited cities for one reason only. They wanted to see antiquities. So th there was a great you know, interest in Egypt, for instance. In, in Victorian times in England, a great fascination with Greece and, and with Rome. History and antiquity was the reason people travelled to visit cities. Paris changed all that. And without us knowing it, we owe a great debt to Paris because of what they did. Why? Because they were the first city to celebrate not what was, but what is. It celebrated their present and their future, not their past. In the 17th century, if you were wandering around over the Pont Neuf, you would find people with the guidebooks of the day, the pamphlets of the day, showing them where they could get the best coffee, the best glass of wine, the best brioche, the latest fashion, and to tell them where to see the newest architecture and where to find the best caterer for their special event, where they could get their cloaks made by the same cloak makers who made for royalty. In other words, Paris told visitors what there was to do and enjoy and experience in their city. That to me is vibrancy. How, how do you get to that, to have people enjoy the fabric and experience of your city? What Paris did in the 1700s is now what we understand what the best cities do. We engage with our people. You know, they're, they're not in the end, no matter how beautiful about the buildings or about natural beauty, for that matter. Sydney is a very, very beautiful, natural beauty city, but that's not what makes it a vibrant city, by the way. It's what my friend Jan Gell, who's one of the great urbanists from Copenhagen, has described as cities for people. And that is a journey that we've been on in Melbourne for probably 25 years, because we were not like that. And I'll talk to you about some of the, the mistakes we made earlier. Now, there's not, there's not a one-size-fits-all approach. I can't come over here and say, here's Melbourne, you know, you, you take some stuff and add that onto Perth and you'll be a better Perth. That's kind of not how it works. Um, each of our capital cities have projects afoot that add to their vibrancy. B by the way, one little aside, which you might not have, have thought about, but which has struck me and I've shared with Lisa before. You know how they say that some owners kind of look like their dogs? I bet you if I lined up every Lord Mayor here on the platform, you'd be able to tell which city we all came from. I'm not saying that's a good or a bad thing, I'm just saying you would be able to tell which city we came from. And that's interesting, because a little more of that later. Um, each of our capital cities have had projects that have added to their, their uh, vibrancy. Uh, Colin talked a little about the rejuvenated uh, public and, and other spaces here in Perth. The same thing's going on in Adelaide, Canberra and Hobart. 
They're building a 200-kilometre bike network in Sydney. Uh, the water catchments they're doing in Brisbane are quite remarkable. Um, they're uh, building projects to encourage walking and less car use in Darwin. And that's something that I believe very passionately. I don't believe any great city of the world is trying to bring more cars into the centre. So I've got to work out what that means for the way we live and work as well. But for pure genius, guess which city has the best of all of those projects? It might be a little parochial, but I think it was Melbourne. It was called Postcode 3000. Now, let me go back to where we were. This was the start of our journey. In the late 1970s, early 1980s, and I can't remember the exact year, Norman Day, one of the principal architects in Melbourne, in the Age newspaper, said that Melbourne was a donut city with a dead, useless heart. Pretty harsh words from one of your own. But it was actually right. It was actually right. And those of you who know that great painting by John Brack, Collins Street, 5 o'clock, those grim-faced businessmen pouring out of the city, that's what it was like. And so we embarked on a journey to change that. When we started, long before I was there, when we started Postcode 3000, there were 600 dwellings, dwellings in the central city. And my remarks today really are about the central city, not about the wider metropolis of 4.4 million. I'm talking about the central city. There were 600 dwellings in the central city when we started. Today, there are 28,000 individual dwellings in the central city. So what we wanted to do was create that inner city community not a, a mono-functional business centre. It has to function as that. It has to be a business and financial and retail and other sector centre as well. But it has to have a sense that people live here too. And there are things that you can do, both for visitors and residents, but also people who work there, that, that you can do to change the feel of the inner city. You know, we have the highest ratio of street furniture in the world in our CBD. That's not by accident. That is absolutely by design of, of one of the geniuses of urbanism, Professor Rob Adams, who has been at the city, not coincidentally, for the entire time this renaissance has been happening. We had a multiplicity and a diversity of cafes and restaurants and little bars. In 1978, when we started, there were about 600 restaurants and cafes in the central city. Today, there are more than 2,000. But you've got to make it easy for them. You've got to make it easy for them to open a restaurant or a bar. You've got to be prepared to say yes not have your first reaction from your plan is to be no. Our civic spine is Swanson Street. When I was first elected, it, it was neither fish nor fowl. You know, it was open to traffic from 7 a.m., sorry, 7 p.m. till 7 a.m. and then closed during the day to traffic. And I thought, that's neither fish nor fowl, let's fix that. My initial thought was return cars to it full time. I was persuaded by a number of people whom I respect very greatly, including Professor Rob Adams, that the other way was the way to go. Everyone agreed that street wasn't working. So we closed it to private vehicles. You'll hear some of the results of that a bit later. But at the moment, it carries more pedestrians per day than Regent Street in London. And it's also the busiest tram network in the world. And those of you who come from the retail world know about the importance of footfall, those pedestrians. People don't buy, as I remind retailers, from their car as they drive past you. We're a city of about 4.4 million people. Um, I was charmingly invited by one of your uh, sort of co- or one of your counterparts in Adelaide a few years ago to give a speech over there entitled, What's Wrong with Adelaide? I, <laughs> I gave the speech, but I did move slightly from their suggestion. But one, one observation I made to them is one of our successes, and, and one where I'd argue you are doing particularly well as well. I observed in Adelaide, beautiful city, those of you who know Adelaide, it, it nestles like this little jewel in this beautiful surrounding gardens. It, it's, it's a wonderful ambience of a city. But on a normal day, uh, they're a city of about 1.2 million, they were getting 100,000 people through their CBD, about 8, 9%. In Melbourne, a city of 4.3 million people, on a busy day, we get 1 million people through the centre of the city. And that has a different feel about it. And we think our job is to get people in there for our retail and our hospitality businesses. Then it's up to them. But you need to work out, if you want to be a vibrant city, how do you get those high numbers between 20 and 25% of your total population through the centre of your city? Because that's what you need to do. But come, let me come back to postcode 3000, because we've come just about to the end of that. You know the three reasons that it was a great success? 
Number one, it was an inspired idea to get vibrancy into the city, get more people living in the centre of the city. Number two, my personal favourite, it didn't cost anything. There was no cost to do it. There was no investment necessary. It was showing people a different way of living. And finally, but most importantly, it was about people. And it was the city, the city of Melbourne, who first started converting office buildings to residential and then made the IP available to developers when they saw that there was a market for this, it's taken off. 600 to 28,000 dwellings in the centre of the city. We did make an investment in the most maligned public space in Melbourne. Our city square was a joke. And it had been a joke for 30 years. So we reconfigured it and re-engineered it, we activated it, we made it attractive to visit. And here's the key. We made it attractive to linger there. I was very pleased and I said to Colin uh, and to Lisa before as I was coming back up here, I went past a little patch of grass and it was just a little patch of grass in the shade with some nice trees, some benches up the top there. Well, there were people all over that grass and, and sitting on the benches. I hope you'll forgive me by saying it was just like Melbourne. That's a compliment, okay? That's a compliment. But it was that feeling about people wanting to linger, not to rush through on their way to somewhere else. So we created first-class public realm. We developed that network of small laneways, quirky little laneways where there are bars and restaurants and galleries and bookshops and all sorts of different little shops, a different offer from the major world retailers in Collins Street or the traditional retailers in Swanson and Elizabeth Street. And you'll find remarkable little shops in them. We, we licensed one of them, Hosier Lane, um, obviously the street of stocking makers in, in days gone by, um, for street art. And one of the most vibrant street art cultures in the world thrives in Hosier Lane. And to the, to the point where one of those street artists, Kid Zoom, Ian Strange, has exhibited now at the National Gallery of Victoria. And, and that draws tourists. We, we can't get vehicles down there because it's full of tourists and pedestrians. We widened the footpaths. I mean, we were given a great gift by Robert Hoddle. The politician said to him, build the streets of Melbourne 66 feet wide. He said, nope, I'm building them 99 feet wide. And he did. And that's given us the room later to widen footpaths. And you don't often get a chance, I might say, to make 100-year public policy decisions. One of the ones we made, and it might seem a simple one, we don't pave our streets in asphalt. We pave them in bluestone. It is a beautiful material to walk on. It lasts 100 years. It's attractive. It's cool in summer and warmer in winter. It's just a wonderful paving material. Cost an arm and a leg. And you might not notice it immediately, but it adds to that general feeling that you're building in along with that street furniture, remember, to encourage people to linger. We made it cheap. Another capital city, not Perth, came to me to say, how do you get all these tables and chairs out on the street from these restaurants? We make it cheap for restaurateurs to do it. The comment from that Lord Mayor was, but that, I'd have to forego revenue. Yes, yes you do. But what you get are successful restaurants because they've got more chairs, more seats, more bums on seats, and you get a vibrant street feel. You know, of course the bookshop at the top of Collins Street loves it that Guy Grossi in Florentino has tables and chairs all the way down outside their bookshop. They love it. And so do people wandering up and down the footpath. We actually also required people, when they renovated buildings, and we did this through the planning scheme, you have to activate the frontage. You can't have blank walls onto the street for the first two storeys. You can't have those car parks that go up, you know, from the second floor to about the sixth floor. You know, ugly, ugly, ugly. You have got to activate the street frontage and make people feel that there's life there. Even when the shops are closed, there is life there because they're well lit. And one that's a, a particular favourite of mine, we mapped the, uh, the heat island effect in Melbourne. And we can tell you that in the outer suburbs, it's actually five degrees cooler, five degrees Celsius cooler than it is in the centre of the city. So we've hit upon a really scientific solution to that. We're planting trees. We plant 3,000 new trees every single year. And we develop the biggest stormwater harvesting projects at 10 and $15 million a pop to actually provide, in the end, we think something like 75% of our water to keep our trees alive, because we had that 10-year drought that culminated in, in Black Saturday. And we actually collaborate with all of our major events to try to get live sites throughout the city to sort of support those events. 
but you'll find that people gather to that. You might not be able to get a seat at Centre Court for the Australian Open final, but with two or 3,000 other people, you can watch it on a big screen in a very pleasant public space and have a wonderful experience doing so. We created a new city life, I think is, is what's happened. I keep saying we, I'm, I'm very much the beneficiary at the end of this. Um, two urbanists I, I admire, William Holly White and Jan Gill, believe the essence of city life is epitomised by the vitality of the street and public places. That's what gets you there. And that's what we've tried to do in Melbourne. In a relatively short space of time, in a city's life, a couple of decades. We've gone from what I would call a fleeting city, where people pass through and went back out to the suburbs, to one where people live or stop or linger. Today, I think you measure the health of your streets by, sorry, the health of the city, by what I would call the dance of the streets and the laneways and the parks and the way they work together. The other key ingredient that pushed us was our people. They absolutely demanded that their city council do something about the transformation of the city centre. So we developed a plan, we tested it, we went to the people to get their confidence, and we have stuck to it for 25 years. And that's one of the other great secrets. A more recent one I'd offer to you, of, uh, I think a success on a number of levels, is the nighttime economy. In 2010, I began a campaign to diversify our nighttime economy. We focused on late night activation for galleries. So you might remember when we had Salvador Dali all night, open all night for the last night of the exhibition. But I went to every one of our festivals, and we have a lot of them, the Melbourne Festival, the Comedy Festival, the Jazz Festival, the Fringe Festival, our Film Festival, uh, the Next Wave Festival, as well as the NGV. And I said, if I provide funding, will you put on performances late at night? And I mean 12.30, 1 a.m., 1.30 a.m. And they all responded to that and put on performances at that time of night. What we were trying to do is bring a different demographic into the city at night, late, by broadening the artistic, creative, cultural offer of the city and to try to change its culture. Because we did have problems, as many of our capital cities do, with violence late at night in the city, where the prevailing culture is a young man who's drinking his 40th Bundy and Coke. You know, when a young man comes out of a bar at 2 a.m. and asks his mates, where should we go now? You know what the answer to that is? Go home. Go home. Because although we consider ourselves a 24-hour city, we do need a few hours to sort of wash our face and shine our shoes to be ready for the next day. So it was late night activation, but to change the culture of that. We also have a retail and hospitality strategy. We work with our retailers and our, our licensees and, and everybody to have a, a clear shared vision about where we want to finish up. So where has that led to us? I said before about footfall. Many of you will know the Burke Street Mall. Since I've been Lord Mayor, it's up 10% in footfall on an average weekday and 21% on an average weekend day. Melbourne Central and QV, our large shopping areas, up 14% on the average weekday, 23% on a weekend. And Swanson Street, since we closed it to private vehicles, up 14% in pedestrian activity on weekdays and 20% on the weekends. And that means revenue not just vitality in the streets, it means revenue for those retailers and those hospitality businesses. Because by the way, we know once you arrive in our city, in the CBD, 86% of journeys are made on foot. The knowledge economy, which our cities are transforming to, requires face-to-face -face meetings. Because the nuances and the sophistication that you need to communicate with people in that economy requires face-to-face -face communication. It's not stuff you can do by email or electronically. And so walking it becomes very important. We also focus on safety. And we have CCTV cameras, a network of them throughout the city that can recognise a face from half a kilometre away. They swivel 360 degrees. I have operators 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Helps us with major events, but their eyes on the city at all times. If you're wearing a bright red tie and you do the wrong thing, I can drop out the whole background and follow that bright red tie as it goes through the city and direct stream to police so we can intercept you at a later time. You've got to have a safe city and we work in very close cooperation with Victoria Police. Not just about the hard end though. Here's something you might not have thought. If you come to the town hall in Melbourne, right outside the front entrance is a flower cellar, very brightly lit. And part of his street trading licence means he has to trade until 2 a.m. in the morning. Now, 
that fulfills partly a useful social function for recalcitrant husbands returning home late. <laughs> and that's very important. However, the reason it's there and the reason we ask him to trade that late is because it changes the whole feel of the street. It's well lit, it's flowers, it's activity. And so right from the hard end, the policing and the CCTV, all the way down to the softer environmental design stuff, we think about how do we make our city feel safe for people because that's important. That nighttime economy has been one of our great successes. It's seen jobs grow by 8% over the last five years. Our food-led businesses have outperformed every other capital city. And here's the bizarre thing as all of that happened. Alcohol sales have dropped by 11% at night. And by the way, it's a safer city as well. So changing all of those elements and thinking about how they all work together became very important for the nature of the city. I won't go into too many stats, but I'll tell you in the last year alone, we've had a 17% drop in crime in the centre of the city as well, particularly crimes against the person, but across the full spectrum of crimes. So, in conclusion, the lesson we took from Jan Gill and Rob Adams at the City of Melbourne from Copenhagen was to plan our city for people. Life, space, buildings, in that order. Remember, it's us who shape cities through the decisions we make. But then, here's the interesting symbiosis. Cities then shape us. And they do have characters and cultures. We think that Melbourne is blessed today with a central core city that brings together commerce and education and health and sport and cultural and residential areas, all of which can be accessed on foot, by bike, by public transport or in cars. So we've really thought about how they've all gone together. I, I'd hope you would find if you came to our city, it was brimming with that sort of vibrancies. And that's what the Committee for Perth asked me to focus on. And that's the, the final message I want to leave you. There's no doubt that vibrant cities, whatever that means, are great cities. And I've learned from these great urbanists, particularly Professor Rob Adams, about the answer to that burning question. What makes a great, vibrant city? Now, we need to invest in the public realm, work with key industry sectors like retail and hospitality and creative and cultural and sporting sectors. But there is a simple and short answer, and that's what I would leave you with about vibrancy. Do you know what the answer is? Make great streets. Great streets make great cities. Thank you. Thank you so much, inspiring. We have the luxury of around about half an hour or a little bit more to engage in conversation on what we've just heard there, which is, which is terrific. And obviously it would be lovely to have any comments, questions from you as well. We're gonna try and go through as much as we can in what we've just heard there. Um, th that was terrific. It, it's, it's so good, and this is what you know, I think is so good, when we have these lunches, and the Committee for Perth is great at bringing people who can illustrate and sh sort of show us the vision for how it can be done. L Lisa, if I may ask you to start with, what, in hearing that, what does that do for you? How does that make you feel about Perth? Hi, everybody. Look, I feel incredibly proud about Perth. In listening to Robert's fantastic presentation, a lot of the commentary that I was hearing him speak about is where we're at in Perth. And I loved the fact that he started off by speaking about, you know, respecting the individuality, individuality of the cities. Uh, it isn't a copy and paste scenario. We do need to focus on our unique differences and champion those. But we are on the same page in so many ways and I get the benefit of spending quite a bit of time with Robert at our Capital City Lord Merrill get-togethers and so I hear him speak often and he speaks incredibly knowledgeably and talks about, you know, cities for people. City of Perth used to have that as its strap line for many years. Uh, spoke about the sense back then of our forefathers of you know, going wider with the executive decision on the streets. I just wished we had had that here. And talking about the importance of street furniture, uh, nighttime economy, uh, attracting the right uh, mix of business residents and the focus on our public places and spaces. So I feel very heartened that we are actually tracking very well and Melbourne is the number one city 
but when you look at the minute differences in the percentages, and they are 0.0 of a percent, uh, to be in the top 10, which most of the Australian capital cities indeed are, we should be very proud. We can't see the finished product yet. I mean, if the curtains were open now, we'd exactly. see all the works going on at the moment. I, I guess it's difficult for everyone else to visualise how this city is going to turn out. You probably have observed the plans. You know what is coming. Where are we? How far away from that most livable city are we? The city of Perth um, realised that in 2007, our strategic vision 2029, which, Robert, uh, you asked me when we were founded, it was 1829, and the fact we named our strategic vision 2029 was harking towards the 200th birthday of our city. We knew that we were going to be in for some time of construction as these new precincts were being created and uh, implemented. So we knew that we needed to steady the hearts and minds of the people of Perth by making sure that the city centre as we know it was looking good and would make them feel that they weren't being absolutely hammered from all directions, which in many respects they are with the construction that's been playing out. So we unashamedly went into a very swift program of action projects at the time, 12 of them, which cost quite a bit of money, but they were done within 12 to 18 months. We delivered on all those. I think that had quite a positive effect on the psyche of the central city community to say, OK, they're delivering on promises made, they've heard us, and we actually called them the We Hear You projects as well. That then gave them the uh, mental... Uh, patience to then cope with some of the bigger capital project items that we've offered and committed to, like the library, like the Northbridge Piazza, like the St George's Terrace streetscaping, and I think that resonated with me with what Robert was saying, knowing that we needed to make places like Forest Place look good because there was a huge antisocial element there, and uh, that really helped people understand that we were delivering whilst we are collectively still delivering on the bigger projects. Once mm. those bigger projects are finished, people won't recognise our city. Uh, there's going to be a cross-axis that we haven't had before. We've always had a very strong east-west alignment. We will have a very nice cross-axis of a north-south alignment, which brings the city back into Northbridge, which is being re revitalised. So I think in many respects we are strategically focused. We are because of the nature of labour costs and regimes and times it takes to build uh, things here, taking our time, but we are delivering. Lord Mayor Doyle um, said, Premier, that the city had a very clear plan and it stuck to that plan. Is the plan for Perth to be a challenger, to be the most livable city in the world? Is that what you have in your vision? Uh, well, that would be a very good result, obviously. Um, I guess one comment I'd like to make is if you think when you travel, where do you go to? Um, you go to Paris, you go to London, you go to New York, uh, you go to Sydney, you go to Melbourne and you go to Perth. Um, and that's the destination and that's part of the thinking, I guess, of, of the work that the City of Perth started and what the State Government's now um, joining in in terms of the big projects that will transform the city. I, I think it's fair to say not that many years ago Perth was pretty dull uh, and really lacked soul and we've still got a long way to go. But it was fantastic, for example, two weeks ago with the Giants. Uh, just, you know, one event, a unique event, but just to see over a million people come into the city and the nature and the friendliness and the courtesy. Um, and I thought that may be just a little moment of change for the city of Perth. W wasn't people. it interesting that much of what we have just heard over the last 45 minutes or so has been based on not massive cost, that these changes can be made and implemented relatively easy that could be done relatively easily? I think some can. Uh, let me reassure you, Elizabeth Key and sinking the railway and building a stadium are massive cost. And thank you for your taxes. <laughs> but there are easy wins as well, I'm sure that you recognise, that, that oh, can make a big difference. Well, I think what Robert talked about, and, and Perth is doing that, the laneway activation, and I think the widening of the um, footpaths in Perth has been fabulous. And uh, you know, traffic and uh, how we bring people in and out of the cities, uh, you know, the challenge that we all face right now, but those, those things are relatively inexpensive and do make a city a great place to be. And, and I, th I think we've got over that sort of watershed. Still a fair way to go. William, um, as an urban designer, looking at the city of Perth in comparison to the, the city of Melbourne, we are still incredibly car-dominated. We have 
obviously the freeway that goes you know, pretty much along through the city. And it's still a car mentality here in WA. How do we pull people away from that and get them back on foot or on bikes? I think, I think Robert said it. Um, it's getting more people living in the city, uh, becoming part of the city culture, um, and slowly they will ease themselves out of their cars. Um, I think the, the big projects have been very, very important. But I, you know, my observation of cities over the years that I've practised in different cities and different places is when you get the community to produce all the little projects, it's all the little compounding projects that keep adding to the layer and layer and the graininess of the city. And unless you can capture the community to, to put their money where the things are and attract the people in there, it's those grains. We need the big projects, but we've got to get that community to buy in. Then that gives us real value. Please see. Yep, it should be turned on. Yeah, free. We like um, cheap ideas. I don't, I don't know if you, you do this in Perth, and if you do, I, I, I beg your pardon. One of the things that does the sort of thing you're just talking about, after the Commonwealth Games, we had lots and lots of people who'd volunteered to guide people who were looking for something to do, who, who were really keen to contribute. So we have kept and then continued to recruit. We now have nearly 600 volunteers. Um, I think you have a similar program. And, and we put them in red T-shirts and give them some training. And they go out in threes and fours and they stand on the corners uh, of our streets and they interact with people and visitors and all sorts of people. And, and it's a very, very low-cost intervention. But it makes a huge difference in the feel and the respect and, and the courtesy of the city. You know, and those sorts of things, I think, are very important. You know, that when I talked before about the heart and soul, I wasn't being loosely wrapped. It's very important in a city that that mutual courtesy and respect is also a part of the way a city conducts itself. Uh, Lisa, are we making it too hard to implement a lot of what Robert was talking about? You know, the people say, oh, it's so difficult setting up a bar, for example, you know, getting all this in place and having seats outside. There is just too much red tape or... Are we addressing that now and making it easier? That conversation's been had for quite a few years now. I remember when we had, uh, you know, Charles Landry and others coming through that said there was too much red tape and the no, no, no mentality. The City of Perth very much listened to that. I think that we have very refined processes. We encourage the El Fresco dining and I think, again, that was a point that uh, concurs and resonates with us at the City. Um, I think there's another sort of element here that I just wanted to pick up on what Bill said and where Robert was going with the volunteers, and that's the fact that um, you opened your speech with a word that resonated with a few of us, the word gracious, and it comes back to people. You can have all the best infrastructure on the planet. You can have the brightest lights, the best whatever, but unless you've got the right attitude with the people, you have nothing. And I think... In Perth, we've been a very uh, busy place. Okay, the heat has come off the upper economic cycle that we've had. I don't like the B words, the bust and the boom words, but we know that we're in a more sort of interesting, perhaps a slightly quieter time now, and I think that's good because I think people can take a little bit more time to enjoy their movements around the city, and I think it is that attitude. You know I, will, I often uh, bang on a bit about customer service and that sort of thing, because I think your soft offerings, your cultural offerings, have to match your hardcore infrastructure. You know, you talk about service, and I want people to always get the best coffees. We like the coffees in Melbourne, Melbourne Robert. They are good coffees. I don't want anyone to go to a barista here and get a lousy coffee. You're paying well price, you know, good prices for it. Don't accept mediocrity is what I say. So we need to get a culture of service that matches the elegance that our city is now portraying. And so that comes back to the people, our attitude and our mindset. Mm. And with the lovely comment that the Premier made about uh, the Giants, yes, I was so heartened. I know all of the councillors were as to how that event was embraced by the people. And I feel it's a little bit like the book, The Tipping Point. We've slowly educated people, if they accept these changes, that they're actually really nice for us. We can enjoy them and we can have great things by accepting more culture and arts into our life. And it's kind of a tipping point. People are now actually game to go with the flow of what people like Colin and I might be espousing because they're getting trust in what's being offered. Do you, do you sense that there is, I mean, there's a, a room full of people here who are obviously excited as well about Perth. It's almost like we're waiting for permission to go and create a sort of 
postcard 6,000, you know, that, that sort of we thing. We had a postcard 6,000. I think that was, I've seen that before somewhere. Uh, Cheryl Edwards actually came out with postcode 6,000 when she was uh, in the planning portfolio some time ago. And let's also remind ourselves that the livability index is focused on the greater city, as is the Committee for Perth. And so a lot of this is focused today on the central city and they're inextricably connected and we need to always focus on that. That's correct. I mean, <clears throat> the whole metropolitan area is, is Perth and we get judged in this competition as the, the whole metropolitan area. I mean, the one thing that I've observed, and I think we're getting better at it, um, we are, have been, and we probably still are, a boom town, you know, and San Francisco was, and, you know, like they're the West Coast capital of the United States, we're the West Coast capital of Australia. We probably still have a bit of that boomtown thing. The problem with that is I, my, I, what I witness is the social divide gets a little bit broader. And I think everyone in this room has experienced that, where some people you knew were the winners and some people were the losers in the last, in the last boom. I am always concerned when that social divide gets too broad. And, you know, I, I have a friend in Brazil who's quite famous. He says, you know, when the, uh, uh, <coughs> the poor will... When the social divide gets very bad, the poor die of hunger, but the rich die of fear. And I don't think we're at that level, but when the divide is broad and people don't have, it gets petty crime and things like that that affects the amenity. And I think if we can learn th for, you know, so that we don't get the winners and the losers, but we actually keep it a bit closer, we'll end up with a lot better city. Robert, maybe I can ask you about that. You know, how, how you make it more inclusive so there isn't the them and us. Uh, what, what would your take on that, especially given that Perth has quite a lot of that, given the fact that it's had 10 years of pretty high growth? It, it's one of my greatest fears. I mean, the, the thing I think about more than anything else is planning for Melbourne's growth. I mean, I don't know when it's going to be, but the ABS says that sometime in the next 15 to 20 years, we overtake Sydney as Australia's largest city. Um, so in that, how, how are we going to make sure that people aren't left behind? I wouldn't want you to think that Melbourne is some sort of exemplar in all things, by the way, even though, speaking coffee, anywhere in our city, you are within 50 metres of a coffee machine and a barista who is waiting for you. Um, but... You know, l let me give you a couple of examples that I think are, are really dumb growth about our city which perpetuate that divide. Um, there's a new suburb called Point Cook in Melbourne. You may know it. It's uh, on the way to Geelong. It's uh, an old Air Force base. Very, very expensive houses there. Uh, you know, in the order of, of sort of, uh, not your prices, of course, but uh, in the order of $700,000, $750,000. And in a recent report by the Grattan Institute, they made the point that there are more induced births in Point Cook than any other postcode. Why is that? It's because if you get in your car, it takes you an hour to get on the freeway, and then it might take you an hour on the freeway to get to the hospital. So women and their doctors are making choices around inducing births because of planning. Now, that to me is, is stratifying people in a different way than you meant economically that I think is just shameful. But if there's one thing I worry about, it is that we've got we've got two speeds happening in Melbourne. You know, manufacturing of motor cars will cease in Melbourne. That's 28,400 jobs. A third of those people will work somewhere else straight away. A third will struggle but find some different work. A third of them will never work again. Now, at the same time, as we're losing all of those jobs, we created 80,000 jobs in the centre of the city. And we do a census of land use and employment so we know exactly who they are and what they're doing. They're in the knowledge economies. They are the people who are buying the 4,000 apartments we build in the central city every year. But what does that stat tell you about the way the economy is going? And I think it's one of the great problems we have to address, and cities can't do that, state governments can't do it. We, we need to do it in a new federation, somehow looking at how we deal with that particular problem. You, one of the things that came out of your talk was to me, I, I wrote down the words, more give. You, you, you want to give, and sometimes it almost seems counterintuitive, perhaps, to, to, to do that giving, but in return, you get a massive benefit. Is that something that we could learn from in Perth? Well, um, I'm going to make a confession here. I wasn't going to tell you this, but I, I told Colin, and he will tell at some point, I know. A couple of years ago, the Melbourne Festival brought me an idea called The Diver and the Little Girl. <laughs> 
And I said, with all of my knowledge, that'll never work. I'm not funding that. Well, how did that go for you in Perth? Um, so that wasn't a great call. But the interesting part to me was not, not just the numbers of people, not just the emotional involvement and engagement they had with that remarkable installation that was, I, I said to Colin, a collaboration between government, NGO, and the private and philanthropic sector that, that is very Perth. But for me, the key to it was this. You made it free. Mm. You made it free. So I in a time when, when families are struggling and, and they do look at their utility bill and their mobile phone bill and they worry about their car payment and their house payment, to be able to take the family to a remarkable event like that at very low cost and feel a sense of enormous civic pride and great family pride, I, I think is a wonderful thing. If, if you're in Melbourne this coming weekend, it's our Moomba Festival. 1.2 million people will, will come to Moomba. 100,000 people will see the Moomba Parade uh, on Monday. Very wise choice. I chose as my king of Moomba, Shane Warne, and my queen of Moomba, Pallavi Sharda, who is a very beautiful 26-year-old Bollywood dancer. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> Can I just jump in what on that? What could possibly go wrong? But, but that, that idea... That, and that, I think, not just that huge installation, but that beautiful, beautiful idea that it's free for families and members of the public, it's wonderful. And that's one of the answers. That's why you do it. That's why you give. Mm. Colin's free. thought bubble, there's nothing as such as free. You think of the cost. I just wanted to say, this is something our team have heard me talk about before. Every city has the ability to give the feel-good factor. You know, from the city of Perth's perspective, I remember saying, and the councils all agree with me, we can spend millions of dollars on more footpaths, more curbing, more sort of the standard core things that local government do. But when we did the uplighting of Council House, which cost a million at the time, and I can remember the night before we turned the switch, I'm like, I hope they get it, <laughs> and things like that, you need the feel-good factor because, you know, the free issue, the families, giving back is really what is important. People need to feel that they're getting some fun from their city. It can't all be about just delivering the big stuff. And so, you know, accolades to the Premier for being, you know, the key driver there of the uh, funding for the Giants. These sorts of things are transformative to the psyche of your yeah. citizenry. Uh, Premier, I want to ask you, uh, based on what uh, Lord Mayor Doyle said, that the key to a vibrant city, the key to a great city, is life, space, buildings. How do you think Perth scores on those three? Well, I think we've had some unfortunate history, um, but we are doing as well as we can now. And I think if you look around uh, the civic improvements that the city's done, I think footpaths in particular, uh, a lot of heritage buildings, the ones we have left, have been reactivated um, and beautifully restored. And I guess the Treasury Building and the development around Cathedral Square and the new City Library um, is excellent. Uh, Elizabeth Quay, uh, I hope we see some great architecture go into that. It's going to be the, the best piece of real estate Western Australia will ever have. Um, so to the architects here, you know, please make sure it's something special. I think if you look at the um, BHP building and the way in which uh, all that area around uh, the Print Hall has been redeveloped, I mean, that's simply come alive. And the transformation is quick. It's, it's, you know, it's only really been in the last four or five years, I think, that the big changes have happened. So um, I'm optimistic. I think we need a beautiful city. Uh, Lisa, I wish you'd pull out all those eucalypt trees you've got down Wellington Road Street, uh, plant some trees that are green and shady. Eucalypts need to be in their thousands, not one or two. They look ugly. Um, so there's a few things to be done yet. <laughs> you see that little dig? Well, that's okay because I think Wellington Street will become a promenade in the future and, you know, the, the climatic conditions here are testing, are looking across at some of our guys who are in that area and they're laughing the hardiest because we do talk a lot about trees and we plant a lot of trees and it is a topic for conversation because the canopy cover and the shade does really give a different vibe to a street. I, I hope my media Look, colleague... Let me something about trees. That, um, <laughs> we, we have, as, as you know, Melbourne is characterised by plane trees along streets like St Kilda Road, and we have the last great stands of elms left in the world because of the Dutch elm beetle and, and the, the disease there. But many of those, in an urban situation and following the 10 years of drought up to 2009, are coming to the end of their natural life. And, and what we've got to start doing for, for my grandchildren and great-grandchildren is replacing like with like where we can, which you will see along St Kilda Road, so that we don't take them all out at the same time. 
I'm about to take out 19 plane trees in Flinders Street, and, and it is going to, that might sound small. These are mature 100-year-old trees, and people are going to go ballistic, but I have to because they're at the end of their life. And so if we don't plan for that, you know, if we don't think about that cover, and, and we really want to plant 30,000 trees, the, the difference it will make to the ambience of the city and, and the pleasantness of the city and helping people to linger cannot, cannot be overestimated. What, it, what's the cost of that, just so we, you can uh, account It's for around it. $6 million a year. Okay. But, but there are also three very big projects that were stormwater harvesting projects. Um, I've got one tank that's uh, 5 million litres. Uh, and they were about 14 or 15 million dollars each to complete. Um, one in uh, Royal Park, one in Fitzroy Gardens, one in Birrarung Ma. But they have to go with that because we very nearly lost our trees after that drought. Can, can I just say, I, I used to collect stamps when I was a small boy, and um, Australian stamps. And the 1956 Olympics in Melbourne, I can still remember when that stamp came out. Some of you might remember it. And what I saw was a Melbourne street uh, with trees. And I can remember thinking, wow, a city with trees. They haven't got one of those. So. My fellow uh, media colleagues will uh, have no doubt documented the fact that uh, our Lord Mayor said that Wellington Street would one day become a promenade. Because uh, it, 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 it seems so far away, and yet you obviously can visualise where it's going. Do you think that the rest of the community know where it's going? Do you think it's being communicated well enough? Well, I'm very uh, strong on the need for communication because I appreciate that a lot of people aren't able to know uh, because the news just isn't that way. It only gives the few second grabs and the topic of the day. I'm being a little bit sarcastic there. Whatever that is, they don't actually work to really inspire people about the vision that's trying to be unfolded. So those who are making the decisions have the vision. And I think that, uh, let's not forget, we're sitting in one of the world's top five international botanical gardens, which is literally, you know, a walking distance away from the city. So we are in very good shape. We have, uh, you know, Supreme Court gardens. We have uh, beautiful parks and garden space around our city. So I think there is a tendency to be harsh on ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I think that's great because I think a city that is harsh on itself is trying to be better and trying to always improve. You never want to be thinking you're that good. Always try and improve on what you've got. Thank Here's you. another Melbourne idea for you with your trees. You can email a tree in Melbourne. You could we what? have digitally mapped every tree in the CBD and you can email an individual tree. And if your letter is interesting, the tree will email back. <laughs> <laughs> for obvious purposes, please don't send a paper letter, but emails they will respond to. <laughs> Do I have any... Uh, we've got 10 minutes or so, 10, 10, 12 minutes or so for questions. So if anyone would like to uh, ask a question, perhaps you could uh, just raise your hand. There are microphones uh, around as well. Don't be shy. I know it's... Uh, Right at the front. Do, do you want to just, and I'll, I'll, I'll speak it out if, you, if they can't uh, hear. Just go for it. Sorry, I think we need a microphone. <laughs> just, just one coming. Here we go. Thank you. It's not a question, it's a comment. Um, all the uh, Australians, we live in different city. No one, um, or everyone believes they live in the best city in the world, in Australia. This is a very good feeling. All my friends live in different cities in Australia. No one said, I wanted to move to Perth, I wanted to move to Melbourne. Because which city we choose, we love them. So this is a very good feeling. It means that generally, Australia is the best place to live. Okay, that's good. <laughs> and remember, the reason, the reason we've got to get cities right, you know, if, if you go to fora around the world and they talk about cities, it, it's an object of, of great interest to them that the world itself has just tipped over the point where 50% of the world's population now live in cities. That's the first time in human history that has happened. We have always been the highest urbanised nation on Earth. If you discount Monaco and the Vatican City, we are the most urbanised nation on Earth. So for us to get cities right is particularly important for our way of life. Let me ask uh, Brad Pettit for his uh, question. He's, I think it's just going to follow on from what you've just heard. Is that right? Oh, not, not exactly, but it was a question for, for Robert Doyle. Um, one of the things I love about Melbourne, of course, is you have trams and light rail. And the question is, 
do you think it could be the most livable city, or would it be, if, it, if you had, like every other city, dismantled your light rail in the 1950s or 60s? And can Perth ever be the most livable city in Australia without light rail? Okay. Yeah. Um, first of all, if I'm not mistaken, you're from the great city of Fremantle, aren't you? Yeah. Uh, I had the great honour of standing behind your team on grand final day uh, recently. <laughs> And can I tell you, from my great height, standing behind Aaron Sanderlands is a <laughs> terrifying thing to do. Um, look, we were lucky. We, we've got 250 kilometres of tram network. It's, Swanson's, it's one of the biggest in the world. Swanson Street's the busiest tram route in the world. Um, trams are free in, in the immediate CBD and surrounding areas, so people can jump on and jump off. Uh, I don't think we would be without that tram network, would be as, as livable because transport and moving people and connectivity is so important to livability. That doesn't diminish the walking economy in the city, as I've said. And, and tram networks won't move large numbers of people great distances. But as shuttle transport in and around a core city and a few radial lines, it's unbeatable. Um, at the moment, though, we're, we're even thinking about how to improve it. So we're in increasing the space between stops because they're, they're too short and therefore the journeys are taking too long but we are investing in new trams that are very, very large, which give us problems because we have to create super stops for them. So, you know, with the network, there go certain problems. But the other part is, you know, Melbourne wouldn't be Melbourne without the trams. Um, Sydney I is about to make an enormous investment uh, in, they've finally torn down that ridiculous monorail thing. Every time I saw it, I was reminded of that Springfield, uh, you know, the, 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 the monorail episode in, in The Simpsons. And I'm thinking, yeah, up there with North Haverbrook, for those of you who are Simpsons fans. <laughs> anyway, um, so no, we would not be. But they are, at great expense, putting in a light rail, and, and that's very important. I think there are ways around it. I mean, I, I don't think you have to have a tram network, but I think you do have to have a highly efficient shuttle in a service for C moving lots of people. Can we challenge your status as number one without a light rail? Uh, no, nah, not really. <laughs> <laughs> Um, look, it, there, uh, Lisa is right. The, the, the gradations between the top cities are, are very, very small. Um, and when we, four years ago, we knocked over Vancouver on something that the Mayor, Gregor Robertson, still says was a mistake made by the assessors. Um, by the way, when we did, this is the sort of bloke I am, when we did knock over Vancouver as the world's most livable city, I sent Gregor a message just letting him know. It would have been the middle of the night in Vancouver, but I thought he'd want to know straight away. <laughs> it's been very grateful ever since. Uh, uh, look, it's th the hard part about livability is it, it's the combination of things. You know, it, it's not any one thing, but if, if you're missing one of those important elements, um, and the thing that gives Australia a flying start is our health system. You know, free access on the basis of need. You know, that, that's, that's not something that's matched in very many countries our size. The other thing that benefits us is our size. Don't get hung up on livability, though. I mean, I know I, I go on and on about it, but, and on and on and on about it. I mean, you know, Shanghai, the world's biggest city, and New York, the world's most exciting city, are not livable. But they're hell of no. places. They're can remarkable <laughs> places. So it's only one element, I must say. Uh, well, in, can in I just bring in here. William on this? On this, you know, we, it's yeah. been kind of put on the back burner this whole light rail, and yet we're hearing that it's absolutely essential that it, it becomes, you know, front of mind. Light, light rail is really important, and I've travelled, in fact, with the South Australian government many five years ago, to a lot of cities that. Um, have implemented light rail. In fact, in the United States, over 100, 100 cities are now implementing light rail, and that's you know the home of the automobile. Um, light rail is really good about bringing people in. It's giving access to the CBD. But what it also does, it, because it's a rail and it's steel, it fixes the location, and that precipitates developers to, at certainly at the stops, to develop different ranges of housing choice. And one of the things that I think this city lacks is housing choice. You're either in an apartment or you're in the burbs and there's not a lot in between. Light rail, when it gets a little bit out, precipitates a whole range of different housing. And Melbourne's got a huge amount of that now, which is being developed around on the old, you know, what I call brownfield sites. Docklands. Mm. But, I mean, if there's one thing that will knock us off, it, it's not something you will do. We are in the middle of what I think is the world's most interesting urban social experiment. I talked before about Sydney, and, and they're quite rightly focused on Barangaroo, which is 22 hectares right near the city as, as a brownfield site and a development site. If you think about Melbourne, in the immediate proximity of the CBD, immediately adjacent, we have South Bank, 
about 90% complete. Dock lands, about half complete. Fisherman's Bend, the old industrial area, haven't even started it yet. Egate, which is up on the edge of Docklands where the old rail yards are, haven't even started it yet. And Arden Macaulay, the old industrial area of what you might know as North Melbourne. They're all in immediate proximity to the CBD and they add up to 640 hectares of urban renewal. Lisa? Well, no one's mentioned the term today, but I think we do need to talk about that focus that has to be had on urban infill and the mitigation of the urban sprawl. It is embarrassing that we have urban sprawl that is nowadays compared to the likes of Los Angeles. Yes. We need to really make a decision that we're going to mitigate against that because it is going to enhance the livability when we get those kinds of numbers that Robert's just spoken about moving to these inner city locations. Okay, hopefully enhanced by what Bill says with the uh, introduction of uh, more public transport. And I think, you know, this is the lifestyle change that we've got to sell to people some people still are wedded to this notion of the backyard, the front yard, but when you look at the stats behind it, having to replicate schools and other social infrastructure in those areas, it's just not going to work you know, economically. We really need to focus. And I'm very proud of the fact we have an inner city school uh, being built at the moment, albeit a private one, uh, but we are getting there. And I think those kinds of discussions need to be had a lot more in Perth. But don't do what we did. Do not do this, and this, this is where local government fails you, and, and you've got to encourage local government, and it's easy for the capital city, we're, we're a little different. You know, I don't have wards, we're, you know, I'm elected directly, so it's a little different for me. But the last planning minister, and he is a personal friend and of my side of politics, but he invited councils to redefine the zones in their area, and one of those zones was the most restrictive. And what did every craven suburban council do? Zoned it the most restrictive thereby locking yeah. their own grandchildren and great-grandchildren out of the suburb in which they live. Yeah. And, and and unless you're, you know, and I can tell, we've got a municipal strategic statement that identifies areas of growth, areas of change, areas that are relatively stable, and we'll get a proposal before us that's in an area where a number of my councillors live, and that proposal will be compliant with dress code, it'll be four to six storeys, it'll be medium and reasonable density, it'll provide for car parking, it will be set back, it will be well designed and they'll vote against it. Yep. Lisa, well, quickly. Political will is the other thing that we need yeah, to yeah. bring in here because, I mean, um, and I'm so heartened that uh, the Premier has agreed to move forward with us on the Capital City Act because, you know, I've said it to Colin in meetings and I say it in other meetings, we're all on the same team here, it's the Perth team. And when we look at the com competition that exists nationally and internationally, it is about working together and pulling in the same direction and appreciating he's got to be more macro, I can be a bit micro, but together we can do it really well. Thank you. Let's have a question here. Thank you. Yep. Go on. One or two. Yep. Henry Boston from the Chamber of Arts and Culture. Um, I've noticed that the word culture and uh, excitement was mentioned many times during your speech, Lord Mayor, and has been mentioned a number of times during the panel session. How critical do you think having a cultural strategy or cultural plan to sit beneath all of this vibrancy is important as a capital city? Not beneath, right beside. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, if you think of Melbourne and you thought, you know, what would most people attend on a weekend? I'll bet most of you would think immediately of a sporting event. And, and we have a lot of those and we're very proud of that sporting culture. But more people attend a cultural or a creative or a performance event every weekend in Melbourne than attend a sporting event every weekend. We're actually thinking, and we have a, a natural advantage, where we've built a sporting precinct which is magnificent, but by accident we've got a whole lot of our cultural institutions in one street that goes down towards South Melbourne. And so what we're looking to do actively with the state government is develop that street to become not the only arts precinct, but the central arts precinct around which we can plan a whole lot of activity and it includes the National Gallery and the Recital Centre and the ABC and the Malthouse Theatre and the MTC uh, and a range of other cultural institutions as well. Um, so we see it as being absolutely crucial to the life of the city. We weren't blessed with you know, your weather and your beaches um, or that magnificent river. Ours is not quite the swan, if you know the Yarra. <laughs> um, you know, we weren't blessed with that beautiful harbour. You can't take a photo of the bridge and the opera house and get a snapshot of Sydney like you can like that. 
So we've had to work our bums off on events. And that's what we have done. You know, if I go back two weekends, two weekends, I had on in the city White Night, which is 450,000 people overnight, all night. We had Chinese New Year the next day, 120,000 people. 88,000 people went to see India and South Africa at the MCG. I had the Eagles playing at Rod Laver Arena and Guy Sebastian down the other end. We had Soundwave, which was a young person's music festival that had 60,000 people out at the showgrounds. And we had Black Caviar, um, Lightning Stakes Day at Flemington, which attracted uh, about 50,000. So we think about 90,000 people, sorry, 90, 900,000 people attended an event in the city over that weekend. And March gets busier for us. We're running really short of time. Just a quick one. Do you think Perth, you know, you're an outsider, you're coming here, you see the city for what it is. Do you think we make the most of our beautiful natural resources? Are, are we missing a trick? Could we put more life around it? How many people in the room? <laughs> it's, a good, it's a good way to make 400 enemies at once, isn't it? Um, I, think, I think from an outsider, and I, my, I've got to be careful because my very best friend lives in the city, um, and we've been friends since 1966, so I don't want to lose him. Uh, look, I think many of us, except for Sydney, made one mistake. As we grew, we didn't embrace our waterway. We certainly didn't embrace Docklands and we did not embrace the Yarra River. And we are working very hard to do that now with some notable successes. If I could note the biggest change I note in coming to Perth over very many years, and I did point out to the Premier that I actually played football here against Hale school and I, I believe I may have slept billeted in the area where his office is now. So since then to now, the thing I notice more than anything is your very determined attempts to embrace that magnificent waterway. And I think that is very important. You've got to that that big whatever it was, airstrip that was between the city and, and the and the river, you know, what you've got to do is drag the city down to the river. Drag the city down to the river and embrace it. And I see you doing that and I think that's a great thing. Fantastic. We are out of time. It has been a pleasure and a privilege to, to hear your thoughts, your, your vision, and to share that with us. And uh, especially given the fact that we're now going to come and compete and maybe even challenge and even win in the years to come. And, and then you, we, we'll maybe come over to Melbourne and show you how to do it. All the best with that. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for being here. Lord Mayor, thank you. Premier, thank you very much indeed. And William, thank you very much for being part of the panel. Thank you. Thank you. Just before, <laughs> no, it's not raining. <laughs> and as for that view, does it get better than that? Isn't that tremendous? We're on the best seats in the house. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, to, uh, to close out, uh, Abra de Klerk from AECOM is going to give a vote of thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, excuse my voice. Um, must have known this is going to happen, but um, what a fantastic you know, event. Um, welcome to all of you. It's been absolutely fantastic. I mean, first of all, to the Right Honourable, the Lord Mayor of Melbourne, Robert Doyle, it's been an absolute pleasure. I think the gentleman you're referring to in Brazil might have been. Now, the gentleman you refer to in Brazil was in the city of. Sorry, there you go. You know, that's, uh, you know, in the city of Curitiba, some, you know, Jamie Lerner. I had the uh, honor to meet him once, fantastic as well. Anyway, um, just I think, you know, before I give a couple of, uh, you know, sort of observations in a moment, we'd like to present um, the Honorable uh, Lord Mayor with a present, something that you can hang right next to your most beautiful picture of Melbourne. And then to the panelists, um, the Honourable uh, Colin Barnett, MLA, Premier of uh, Western Australia. Uh, thank you very much for being here. It's always a pleasure. Uh, the Lord Mayor of Perth, uh, Lisa Scafidi. Um, I've got a couple of tips, some notes that I've made, which we can discuss about how we get to number one in a moment. But, uh, you know, very important. And then to Bill Haynes. Uh, Bill has been influential in a number of areas. He continues to do that. He plays an active role, you know, with the Committee of Perth as well. 
and uh, you know we are very honoured, Lord, to always have your input. You know, very good from that point of view. We'd like to present uh, them with some pictures as well. Just a couple of uh, quick observations, um, and I was making notes like mad, you know, to make sure that, uh, you know, we're aligning ourselves to get there, but I think, you know, one of the most important questions we'll ask is, you know, what gives the city vitality? Talking about a million people through Melbourne on a, in CBD on any given day, very important. I think the one stat that will stick with me is 600 dwellings to 28,000, because you carried on, you know, talking about, you know, cities for people. And I see it as a bit of a, an evolution, you know, from the point of view is that, you know, you talk about footfall, which goes to revenue, which goes to vibrancy, and that actually creates your safe circle back, you know, to footfall again. So, you know, it's just fantastic, you know, from that point of view. Now, I think the most important, if you don't remember anything that was said today, you've got to remember the tip that uh, the mayor gave us as to how we're going to beat Melbourne. He said, ask the whys, and if you answer them in full, mayor, then we will beat Melbourne to number one. So, uh, you know, we'll definitely be doing that. Um, as ACOM, we're actually running a, a, a number of programs at the moment and looking at vibrant cities and that type of thing. And, and I think it's only because we can all contribute to that. And maybe we're just left with uh, cities, you know, shape us. And, and certainly I can, you know, agree with that. Um, just in closing, you know, um, thanking you again all for coming. I wish you a safe trip back to where you're going to work or wherever. Thank you very much to the Committee for Perth, you know, for hosting this. There's only one issue for me, is that every time we have one of these events, they seem to have stepped up from a previous one. So, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's quite a bar that you're setting. Reminder to everybody that uh, the next Perth and Focus event will be on the 3rd of June, where uh, the Committee for Perth will be launching their gender equity project, Filling the Pool. And then perhaps just, uh, you know, for Marion, um, I did make a note as well to say that Marion is in the market for a pair of stiletto cycling shoes. Thank you very much. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. There is no more. And uh, we hope you've had a wonderful afternoon. We'll see you again next time. Thanks for coming. Thank you.